but thank you guys for coming here. Uh, my name is Barry Tarleton, and uh, this is my Kafka light show. I work at Nationwide, been there, Nationwide out of Columbus, Ohio, been there for about 17, 18 years. I've been doing software development for about 20, 20 a little over 20 years. And about four or five years ago, uh, our company started using Kafka, started uh, getting into event-driven architectures, event streaming, and uh, the team I'm from is tech consulting. So our job is to provide technical uplift across a variety of technologies at, at our company. So I'm kind of like a developer advocate. So we try to help our developers learn new technologies, use them correctly, you know, programming best practices, those kinds of things. So as we were starting to use Kafka, I knew, hey, this is something I'm gonna have to, to teach to others. Well, first I might wanna learn it myself, right? So I decided to, um, I of course did all the things, download Apache Kafka, get it running, create some consumers, producers, get it playing on my machine. Then after a while I decided, hey, I really wanna understand this better. And I love playing with um, electronics, like Raspberry Pis and things like that. And that's what this is all out of. So I said, hey, what if I created my own Raspberry Pi Kafka cluster to demonstrate this, like it'd be nice to be able to see how the messages actually flow, right? To, to understand it myself, first of all, but then also be able to teach it to others. And so that's what this monstrosity you see up here is all about. And uh, so we're gonna get to that. And I always ask myself sometimes, why do I do these things? There's so many moving parts. Everything you see is actually working, running software and hardware. Okay, there's no videos, no smoke and mirrors, although I have been tempted to use some smoke just to enhance some of the effects, but this is all live. Um, so a lot of things could go wrong today, or it could be amazing. Either way, hopefully you're entertained and you learn something. So to, to level set, I just wanna talk about um, a few things generally about Kafka and how they relate to what we have up here before I get into some live demos of working with what you see in front of you. So first of all, when we're talking about you know, Kafka, we're typically talking about event-driven architectures, event streaming. So what is an event? So when we're talking about events, it's typically just a message that's indicating uh, a change in state, right? Something has happened. Uh, and state can also often flow with that event message or just indicate that something has changed. Like maybe a, you have an application that allows customers to change their address. So once that customer's address has changed, you might, might broadcast an event that says, you know, John Smith's address has changed. Um, and maybe that's enough and the downstream systems need to know, oh, John Smith's address changed, let me call back and find out what that changed to. Or you can send the state along with it, John Smith's address changed to 123 Main Street. Uh, but in Kafka, messages always contain a key and a value. I shouldn't say always, they don't necessarily have to contain a key, but they can contain a key and a value. And we'll come back to talk about what that key is for later. But examples of event messages might be account created, you know, item added to shopping cart, temperature reading was 75 degrees, or in our case, red button pressed. Um, throughout this presentation, you're gonna see this little call out, these spiky call outs, that represents event messages. So our event messages are actually gonna represent uh, buttons being pressed or a message indicating a color in an RGB value. Uh, so red, green, blue, and different values of like zero to 255. So um, example message of 25500, if that's on the topic, then that means it's a, a red message, right? If it's 0255, that's a green message. And you can have any combination of messages in between that. Um, so topics are where we store our events, right? So topics place to store the event data. In Kafka, topics are really just ordered event logs. And so they're stored obviously in the order that they were received. Our topic is gonna to be called a topic called colors, appropriately named since it stores messages about the color information. And here's some examples of those. Um, so of course, a topic needs a broker. So broker is just the software that manages the topics. And if you have multiple brokers or running together, uh, working together, that's a Kafka cluster. And so this is an example of a single broker, broker zero with two topics on there, the accounts topic and the topics colors. And this is just an example. Uh, my broker has the topics colors, but it doesn't have an accounts topic. My broker actually is, if you, I have these three, you see these three horizontal bars going across. Behind them are actually three Raspberry Pi 4s. Uh, Raspberry Pis, if you don't know what those are, are mini computers, very powerful and very small. 
this is also, they're in a 3D printed case, so they're all stacked on top of each other. They're all connected to their own little network. Uh, if you actually pulled out your phone and looked at Wi-Fi, so there should be like a Kafka network, I forget what it's called, but uh, they're all connected to that uh, little network. And so I have three brokers running. And the topic data that goes across those brokers is gonna be represented by the lights you see going across. So as the lights, uh, or as a message goes through a broker, you see lights light up to indicate the message is flowing across that specific broker. And of course, the, the color of that light will be based on the message that's on the topic. So producers, we need producers to produce events, right? So um, obviously a producer creates and produces events to a topic. Examples, you might have a shopping cart application that every time someone adds an item to the shopping cart, that produces an event onto the topic. And again, they're added to the topic in order. Our producers are these little boxes that I have. I'll flip over to the live video and show one of those. So this, these little boxes actually have Raspberry Pi zeros in them, mini computers uh, with a little battery to operate it. But it's a full-fledged Linux operating system on there, full-fledged, it's a micro-sized Linux operating system running Python code that has producer uses, the, actually uses Confluence uh, Python library for the libraries to produce messages. So when you press a button, so for example, you press um, you know, the blue button, it'll send a message 00255, and so forth and so on. Consumers, so we're in, um, in Kafka and event streaming, typically consumers are obviously the thing that subscribes to the topic, and it's also kind of like why we care. If nobody ever cared about the events, you know, they wouldn't be produced. So ultimately, this consumer is the thing that reads the message and, base, and uh, you know, does something based on the event that it received on the topic. Uh, unlike Cubase systems, right, with Kafka, consuming does not actually remove the message, right? It just reads it. And uh, this takes us to a concept of offsets, which we'll see live here in a little bit how this works. But offsets, right, each consumer that is consuming from a topic uh, has its own offset. It's technically a consumer group. So you can actually have multiple consumers consuming from uh, the same topic that actually work in conjunction with one another. Uh, a good example of that, I mean, let's say you have a billing application and this, they're reading from a topic of address changes. Uh, obviously in production, you never want to just have one instance of your application running, right? You want to have some resiliency there. So you could have multiple consumers reading from that same topic that are all part of the billing application. Uh, and so what happens is Kafka can remember where the consumer group is, where that billing application is in the topic by using uh, an offset, which is really just a pointer to the last read message. So like you have consumer group one, and maybe it's read up to this point, you know? Uh, then it's gonna consume the next message and its offset gets updated to say, hey, here's where you're at. So even if the consumers go away, Kafka remembers where they were, so when they come back up, you know, they can pick up where they left off. You could have a different consumer group, let's say uh, claims application, right? So billing needs to care about address changes, so does claims, right? So consumer group two starts up and they haven't read any messages. So they can start at the beginning, they'd have their own offset. And so consumer group two would have its separate offset that keeps track of where it is in reading the messages on the topic. And we're gonna get to that. Our consumers are these, hor are these vertical bars right here. So actually you can see we have these three little boxes. We have two blue on the outsides and we have a red on the inside. Uh, those are actually, again, Raspberry Pi Zeros, little mini computers running Linux, running uh, Python code that has the, using the consumer, Kafka consumer APIs to interact with our topic. And as messages come through, as those consumers read a message, it'll light up on their bar. And so you'll see those light up. All right. And that's all for the slides for now. So we'll do some live demonstrations here. Uh, let me see how this is running right now. Let me go ahead and turn off. It's okay. Yeah. I have, currently we have this one consumer running. So I'm going to uh, take my producer and I'm going to send some blue messages through by just pressing this. And so you actually see, as I press the button, the code on this box, which is actually, again, uh, a con computer running producer code and it actually is producing messages and you see them light up. Right now we only have this top broker active. 
So let me send some red messages, and you'll see the red messages, they'll pop up on the consumer, or the producer, here, sorry, the broker here, and then you'll see them pop up on the, the consumer. So as the messages are, are produced, they go through the topic, and then they are pulled up on the consumer. Now, something I should mention, when this light bar gets filled up, so let me pr produce some yellow messages now. As the light bar gets filled up, it, it clears itself. That doesn't mean the messages are gone. That just means I don't have an infinite number of LEDs to show all the messages in the topic at once. So I only show like the last 10 messages uh, in that topic. So that's why you see it clear. Those messages are still there. And so now here's another consumer. Uh, let me turn him on. And he's on a, sec a, a different consumer group. And what you'll notice is that he has been idle, but what I turned him on, since he didn't have a saved offset, he started at the earliest part of the topic. And so now he is starting to process all those messages until he's caught up to where we are. And now here's something interesting. Let me turn this consumer off. I'll turn my consumer off and I'll start producing some messages again, I'll pr produce some blue messages, produce some yellow messages and some red, right? And uh, let me just put two yellow at the top there. And even though this consumer has been off, Kafka has remembered where it left off, right? So when I turn this, consumer group one back on, he's going to pick up where he left off and start consuming those messages until he gets to the end, and then he's waiting for more messages to come in. And this is a good example of how uh, offsets work within a consumer group. Uh, and again, right now we only have one broker in play, but let's see what happens if we add a second consumer to this consumer group. So I can press a button. I can press a button here on the side of this consumer. Hopefully he lights up. So now we have two consumers part of consumer group one. This is kind of like that example I gave you if I had a billing application. I have two instances of that billing application running, right? And now, so two instances are running. So let's see what happens when I start producing some messages. Let's produce a few blue messages on there. And now how about some red messages and just a couple yellow. All right. If you notice, the new consumer isn't picking up any of the messages. Right? And you might think, well, maybe something's broke. Well, think, think about it, first of all. If both of these are part of the same application, like billing, would you want them both consuming the messages? So basically, if, if you did that, you'd be duplicating processing, right? Let's say, especially, that'd be really bad, right? If this was like, you know, payment <laughs> uh, received or deductions, you wouldn't want it duplicated, uh, duplicate processing. So what you see is Kafka is only allowing this one consumer in the group to retrieve the messages. So to prove that, let me turn this one off. Well, actually, what I'll do is I'll actually start producing some messages. I'm producing some red messages, and then I shut it off. I shut this one off. And what we should see is that consumer picks up immediately and starts processing the messages where this one left off. Okay. And so what we have is in this state where, let me get this consumer back on, if we have two consumers running in the same group, uh, but there's only this, this topic here, only one of them will be assigned to read from that topic at a time if they're part of the same group. And this is good if you care about order of processing. Because you might say, hey, why don't they just divide the work? Like send one message here and one message there. Well, if it tried to do that, so let's send a blue message and then a red message, right? Well, let's say the blue message was assigned to this consumer in the group, and the red message was assigned to that consumer in the group. Well, let's say the red message got processed fine. It came in second. And then say the blue message didn't get processed, and it aired out. Well, where should the offset be for that consumer group? Well, if it goes back and says, try the blue message again, well, then it's going to read the red message again, and you can't have that. So what you have is that if you have two consumers in a group, which you have this one topic shared between them, then it's going to divide, it's actually not going to divide, it's just going to assign one or the other to be that consumer. So in this case, we just have a failover. And this is great if you care about order of processing within a topic. But as you guys probably already know, right, there is a way you can divide the work, right? So you can actually take a topic and divide it into partitions. So partition is exactly that. We just divide that topic and it's typically to exist in scalability, to allow more throughput of those messages. So it really divides that event log, which is the topic, into smaller chunks. 
and each partition can be assigned to a different broker. So I'm gonna press a button on my broker here, which will actually run a script to increase the partition size from one to two. So I'm actually gonna divide the single topic colors now into two partitions. And those two green lights make me feel really good because that tells me that partition is now active and that it's on that broker, okay? So what we're gonna have and what you'll see, well, let me just do this live. So we have two, two brokers here, or two brokers in this one topic, colors, is now split, it, split into two partitions. So when I start sending some messages, let's see, the red messages are going to the top broker. The blue messages are now going to this bottom broker. Now I'm getting some feedback here. And then yellow messages, the see yellow and red are on the top broker on this partition, and the blue messages are here. And what you can see is that they've been divided now. The yellow and red messages are going to this consumer in the group. The blue messages are going to that consumer. Let me send a few more blue messages. And uh, what's interesting is that I normally don't have, this middle one usually doesn't pick it up that quickly. Uh, there's a delay sometimes in how long it takes for the consumer to recognize new partitions. Uh, there's a setting that you can set on your consumers. I think it's um, like topic max metadata time or something or age that you can say how often it should go back to the broker and ask about metadata about the topic, right? It just so happened uh, that this picked up immediately. Normally, I have, I have this one set to the default, which is, I think, five minutes. These other ones I have set to, like, this consumer group one, I have set to 20 seconds. So as soon as there's a new partition added, this consumer group knows about it. Uh, this one might take a while, maybe up to five minutes to recognize that there's a new partition. But it, it may not matter in your scenario because it'll still be processed in the order that they were received. Now, when I say that, that's only across that partition. Now, if we think about order of processing, if we look at consumer group one, the blue ones on each side, if I produce you know, two red messages and two blue messages, um, we don't know. So even though the red messages came first, there's a chance that the blue messages get picked up and processed first, right? Because maybe this consumer is, is running slow. So in that case, the, the order the messages were received on the topic, they were processed out of order. But within a partition, they would be processed in order. Meaning, so like if I publish a red and a yellow, so the, it's first going to process the red and then the yellow within that partition, because that's the order they were received in that partition. Uh, but some blue messages could have came on along somewhere in between there, and they could have taken longer or got processed faster than this consumer could process those. So you might be thinking then, well, how do we partition things? How do we determine where the messages go? And that's that key I talked about earlier, right? You can have a partitioning key with the message that tells it how to divide it, and it's actually on the producer. The producer is the thing that actually says, let me look at the partitioning key, and with this message and use it to divide it, uh, this message across my different partitions of that topic. And you can tweak, so if you want better division, you can tweak that partitioning key or the algorithm. Uh, it's easier sometimes to play with the key than to, to change the algorithm behind the scenes, but that's how you can tweak it. So I could actually, if I didn't want all the red and yellow messages going to this top partition and I wanted to split some of them, I'd have to change the, the key. But if you notice, the red messages, since in my case, the red messages always have the same key, the yellow messages always have the same key, and the blue messages have the same key, right? So they all have their own unique key, but it's always the same for the red, and it's always the same for the yellow, and it's always the same for the blue. So every time I produce a message with the red key, it's always going to go to this partition now. So um, a real-world example of that might be like agency data. Let's say you're processing events that come from agencies all over the United States. And uh, you don't care about processing events in the order for all agencies, but maybe within a specific agency, you do care about that order of processing. So then a good partitioning key might be like an agency ID. So the unique identifier for that agency. So therefore, every time your producer sends a message for a specific agency ID, it's always gonna go to the same partition and those will always be processed in order that they were received. So, when you're doing partitioning, you want to think about that, have that strategy of, hey, how am I going to partition these messages? Uh, if you don't care about order of processing, then it's easy. Create as many partitions as you need to get the throughput you want, 
right? But if order does matter, think about in what context does order matter? Uh, if it's a bank account processing, maybe it's an account ID or something for that, right? You need to partition um, in a way that makes sense based on your business scenario, your business problem you're trying to solve. So that is how we can do partitioning. And if you notice here, since we only had one consumer in this group, it got assigned to both partitions, right? And so that's fine. You don't have to have as many consumers as you have partitions. You can have a single consumer if you wanted to, uh, and it would be assigned to all available partitions. So you see, it's getting all the messages. This consumer is getting all the messages where they're split across the blue ones in a separate consumer group with two in that consumer group that are being divided. And I should also mention too, there is, if you notice that there's a delay and that is actually synthetically added. I, I added a slight delay to the consumers. Um, let me turn that off real quick. So what you actually see is how fast it actually is. So if you notice the messages are popping up pretty, this should take care of for two of them. Okay. So let me shut this one off and get the other one. I'm actually sending a special message to tell the consumer to turn off the delays. Uh, all right. So now what you'll see is as fast as I press the buttons, they pop up on the consumers. Because beforehand, I just had this synthetic delay in there uh, to kind of demonstrate them going from the broker to the consumers. But in reality, it's so fast. It's very, you know. So let's add... Well, actually, let me stop there and see if anyone has any questions before I move on. Any questions? Yes. So partitioned into the blue going to the uh, the one on the right. So if that one shuts down, uh, that just that one will just catch up whenever you shut it off. Okay. Great question. So the question was, and this is why I love to have people ask me questions because it reminds me of showing scenarios that I forgot about. Uh, so the question was, since this consumer, and correct me if I'm wrong, since this consumer is assigned to the second partition, what happens if it shuts down? Do these messages not get processed until this one comes back or does it get reassigned? Well, let's see what happens. How about that? All right. So let me verify. I'm sending a red, uh, a yellow, and we'll send a blue. Okay. So we're still partitioned, right? And so now let me shut down this consumer. And now let me send some blue messages. And what happens? They immediately go to the one consumer that's left in the group, okay? And uh, apparently this one still has the delay on it. <laughs> but what happens is when you shut down a consumer, that actually there's, um, within the consumer group, it recognizes that a consumer has been removed from the group and it, it causes it to do a, a rebalance, a consumer rebalance. And what happens is there's a co coordinator that recognizes, hey, uh, one of the consumers shut down. How many consumers do we have left in this group? And it coordinates which one should get assigned to which partitions. And so and it does that very quickly, as you saw there. Let me try this no delay thing again. So I don't like my consumers uh, having delay. All right, there we go. So if I start this one back up, now, here's the funny thing is I can't guarantee which one's going to get assigned to which partition now. Okay. Uh, and it turns out that it looks like they got reassigned back to the way they were, where this one got reassigned to the blue, the second partition, and the, uh, the guy over here closest to me got assigned to the top partition. Great question. Any other questions? If not, I will go to the um, last topic I have here before we get into the interactive portion of this interactive light show, uh, string processors. So typically when we're talking about string processors, we're talking about reading from one source and writing to another source. Uh, in Kafka world, lots of times that's between topics, right? You have a, some process that is running uh, that's reading from one topic and then it's maybe uh, filtering some data and then writing the filter data out to a specific topic. Another, a great example of that is like, Again, going back to my agency example, maybe you're, you have a topic that's receiving agency events from all over the world, and you only care about those from you know, your state. I'm from Ohio, so let's say it's Ohio. So I could write a stream processor that reads from the larger topic 
and then it just filters out the ones that are from Ohio and writes them to an Ohio agency topic. Uh, so that'd be a string processor. It can read from multiple topics and write to one or vice versa. And again, now with string processor, you can have many, what they call sources and many sinks. Where does it read from? Where does it write to? Uh, but in my example, I have a string processor that deals with this, with the messages, it's called a button count topic. So I have a second topic we haven't talked about called button count. And the way this string processor works is it runs and for every button that was pressed within a three second window, it kind of aggregates them. And it says, hey, okay, how many blue buttons were pressed in the last three seconds? How many red buttons, yellow buttons? It doesn't matter, it just looks at unique messages and it aggregates them and says you had three of these messages, one of these, two of these within that three second window and it puts that on the button count topic. And uh, let me go ahead and, oh, before I do that, oops, I'm going to, before I do that, let me spin up a third partition. So I'm gonna press a button, uh, which on here runs a script and hey, that was actually pretty quick. So I see my three green lights, which makes me feel good again. I got a third partition running on this broker and let me make sure this is working here. So, uh, and maybe, where are our green messages going, okay? So, and sometimes, uh, I talked about that delay. The producer can even have a delay before it recognizes the, the new partition. I think I set the producer, uh, yeah, there it is. So now the producer is recognizing this new partition, so I don't know if you can see, the green messages now are going to this bottom partition, the new one. Uh, white messages are going to the middle, and then I've got red, Okay, so red's going to the top, and blue, so it looks like blue and yellow. There we go. All right, so they're all not very equally divided. This is where if I cared about this, right, if you notice I've got just green at the bottom, and it seems like I've just got red at the top, this is where I'd have to tweak that partitioning key or the algorithm to divide them more evenly if I cared about that. Maybe I don't, because uh, maybe I get tons of red messages and not very many of the, you know, blue, yellow, or white. But anyways, I've got all three partitions working. And I'm curious, did anyone pick up the green? Okay, so I don't think this guy has recognized, yeah. So this guy hasn't recognized the green uh, partition or actually the new partition yet. Uh, I won't touch it. I could actually turn it off and back on, that would force it. Then you'd see all the messages fly through, but we'll just uh, give it a second and see. You just should see a ton of green messages just fly across that thing in the middle once it realizes that new partition is there. But we'll go back to my string processor. Um, it would help if I, oh, you do have it up. Okay, so this is actually a Spring Boot app is what I have. It's using Spring Cloud Stream. And this is the only time I'm cheating, when I say cheating, I'm running the code on this laptop, not on my cluster. Uh, the only reason was I had some really weird issues using Spring Cloud Stream, I think that's the name of it, right? Spring Cloud Stream, or Sp Spring Cloud Stream, <laughs> Spring Cloud Stream. Uh, running bad on the, uh, the Raspberry Pis. They're ARM processors, and a lot of things don't always work. Fun fact, too, if you ever want to run Confluence Python libraries on a Raspberry Pi, you may have to compile the librd Kafka, I think that's the library, yourself, uh, onto that, on that. That's what I had to do for all of those, and it's not fun. It takes forever on a little Raspberry Pi proce uh, processor. But, oh, okay. So my string processor is now running, and I forgot there's a little problem. I forgot to mention this little green box here. I actually, I didn't forget to mention it. This is the point in the presentation I mentioned it. The green box is another consumer. He's listening to that button count stream, okay? So what's happening though is my string processor has kicked up, and all the messages I've sent so far during this presentation, it's now aggregating. And what it's doing is it's saying, hey, within this three second window, you know, you had this number of this messages, you know, three red button presses, two blue button presses. And for each message button count that goes on the button count topic, each message going to the button count topic, uh, if it says, hey, like the red button was pressed two times, it's going to write up two of these or light up two of these letters in red. If three green buttons were pressed, it's going to light three of these letters up in green. Now, if you have more than five button presses, because there's only five letters here, uh, it's going to just redraw the whole thing in the rainbow colors. Um, so, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually restart, or actually stop this service and restart it, so we don't, so we can actually see it live. There we go. 
So I'm actually logged into, um, I logged into this and I ran a, a script to basically restart the consumer on here. So to tell it to just start and read the button count messages from here on out. Because the stream processor ran extremely fast through a ton of messages on button count. Um, and now hopefully we should be in a good state to where it will only do what we do from here on forward. So I'm gonna send three blue messages and we'll see if my consumer is up yet. And cause what we should see, actually, let me do this again. Let's do some red messages. Yeah, okay, so there we go. We got three red messages and you notice three letters lit up. If I do, I think I did two yellow messages, yep. And you have two, two letters light up. All right, so this is, again, just illustrating a, second, a stream processor and this consumer is listening to a different topic that is listening to the aggregation of those messages. All right, um, that was kind of boring, but let's get to the fun part. So if you can pull out your pocket computers or your mobile phones, well, give me one second before you do that. I got to start up something. Uh, I'm going to have you go to this URL and hopefully you will see something like you see on the left here, uh, where you can actually choose your own message. And this is, um, you should see the screen here where it has enter values for, you know, the color zero to 255. And I actually see some of you guys doing this. So let me switch. And the URL is bit.ly slash Kafka button. But what you can see now in the live video is your messages are coming through on my broker. Now what's actually happening is uh, you're submitting messages through my website, that little site, and it is sending them to a Confluent Cloud topic. And then I have a script running that's reading from that Confluent Cloud topic and writing them to this local Kafka cluster, because this, this Kafka cluster is on its own network. Um, now, while you do that, we're going to play a game. So I'm going to stop this consumer. So I'm going to stop the, the consumer that was controlling the lights. And now we're going to do a race. The idea is that uh, when I start the race program on the consumer here, uh, it's connected to these lights. And for each unique light or each unique color you send within three seconds, it's going to light up one of the LEDs in here that color. So let's say, you know, you, if you send five blue, blue messages within three seconds, it's only going to light up one blue message or one blue LED, one LED in blue. If you send like a blue and a purple and a pink, then it's going to light up a blue, purple, and pink. Does that make sense? So if you guys are all sending unique colors, it should light up pretty quickly uh, as soon as I start it. And let me start it here. Uh, Oops, if I can find the script. Uh, okay, run race. Why don't I just call it race? All right, so it's, it's lighting it all up in green. This is kind of like your ready, set, go. Maybe I should have done like yellow then green, but it's all green. Okay, now it's ready. So now as you start sending messages, wow, you guys are sending a lot of messages. Uh, and there's 127 LEDs to make up this sign. So that would mean you get 127 unique colors. Well, anyways, you get a bunch of uh, unique colors, at least within those three second windows. And when it gets done, it'll actually repaint the whole thing, I think, in the rainbow colors a couple times. And you guys are almost there to lighting them up. And you see all your messages flowing across the brokers. You can see they're actually being partitioned here. And the consumers are actually picking them up. And I can't tell, did this guy ever figure out about this? Oh, there you go. You finished it. And then it started again. <laughs> So he has actually done it really quickly. And so um, that is my Kafka light share. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about that, or if you want to come up and push the buttons yourself or whatever, I think we have a little bit of time to that. All right. Thank you, guys.